move on big move on changing my research direction. Uh, so most of my work that I'm doing is now focusing on security uh, rather than networking because at the start of my PhD, like seven years ago in Plymouth University, most of my work was on network. Now I have moved towards uh, security uh, side. Uh, so today's talk, we will talk about unlocking and dissecting blockchain technology and we'll try to understand uh, what does it mean? What, does, what, what kind of features and ingredients and characteristics does it hold? Uh, what can it do and, uh, and the problem and challenges as well. So just before we go into the talk, so I'm a senior lecturer here in cybersecurity in Sheffield Hallam University, and I'm leading one of the research team that I created a couple of years ago, now three years, called ISEC Cybernet. And then we have grown from myself to now having six PhD students as a group working under uh, my supervision. And I'm co-leading in one of the uh, uh, key research centers uh, uh, in uh, Sheffield Hallam University. We call it Advanced Health and Wellbeing Research Center. So I'm co-leading there uh, on the digital technology innovation robotic security aspect to promote independent lives. So, uh, so when we talk about the blockchain uh, technology, it is uh, very, very interesting because people really thought of like this technology just came into being when Bitcoin was introduced uh, literally a little bit over a decade ago, de decade ago. So, but that's not really true. If we look into the literature, we find a lot of other resources back in 1990, you know, uh, uh, 90s, like in the initial stage of 1990s, people were already thinking about this idea, but it was not really coming into picture in terms of the real application, probably uh, it, it maybe because of the lack of the kind of resources that is demanded by this blockchain technology. But however, when we heard about this blockchain technology around 2008 and Satoshi Nakamoto or his team or he alone, when he come up with this idea or with a Bitcoin in 2009 with a white paper introduced and the technology in place running, it become very exciting for the rest of the, the world in terms of what this distributed technology can do. And over a period of you know, uh, probably around six, seven years down the line, uh, we see you know, people picking up in a mainstream uh, domain, like when we heard about Ethereum and so on. So it's like mm, literally skyrocketed. As you know, today, if you look at it, probably around a trillion worth in a Bitcoin alone and holding uh, more than 50% of the crypto market. And then you can see Ethereum playing a big role there as well. And then we started seeing not just as a Bitcoin or Ethereum, but more of an application that it has come up from this technology. And we started seeing revolutionizing, you know, in the application in different domains. So we'll start looking into that later on, at least do a bit of a case study of a couple of them. So let's try to understand what a blockchain technology is. So obviously, when we heard about this technology, we know that it is a digitized, decentralized and a secure consensus distributed ledger. So this is really interesting when we think about this, because if we think about this blockchain as a technology, because it is decentralized and it is distributed, there is no real central controller managing the information. There is no uh, you know, trusted so-called as the third party managing the information. So every node or every party involved are responsible in making the system in terms of security, making the system consistent and making the data flow secure uh, 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 in the whole of the network. So it's very interesting. When we heard about Bitcoin, we always relate to blockchain technology. But as we know, uh, blockchain is a technology. Just Bitcoin is an application or any of the cryptocurrency that we hear of is the application of that blockchain technology. Now, if you look at the blockchain, people always see as the public, because the first thing that we hear is the Bitcoin, which is public that everybody can see. Uh, uh, anything that is happening within the network of a Bitcoin network can, is visible. So people always think of the Bitcoin uh, or relate blockchain technology with Bitcoin and understand in terms of this visibility, which is made public, everybody can see. And in fact, that's true. But in a real life application, if you think of a blockchain, Probably that's not the base use case. We have to think of if I want to have a blockchain system that is running only within my university or probably within an NHS healthcare system or probably within an organization and they don't want any of the other stakeholders to participate. In that kind of scenario, probably a private blockchain is more uh, appropriate. And then when we think of it, oh, then what about if somebody wants to join the network? What about if somebody wants to be part of the system, part of the network? Then probably we can think of extending the permission base 
Or we can also think of why not we have a mixture, you know, public or private, depending on, you know, who is participating, who the stakeholders are, what do we make it visible for the outsider or the other stakeholder, or how do we make it, you know, private for the one that is inside. So we can have different kinds of blockchain that we can think of. So it is not just the public blockchain that is actually available. If you look, uh, there are lots of them which are actually working in different uh, array or different range or spectrum across these different types of blockchain technology. Now, but there are some common properties if we can think of, if we think of just a network or uh, whether it's a private or public or consortium, that if we think of that blockchain network, uh, the idea is everybody who is in that network should be able to see the information, should be able to make it visible and transparent. And then whoever is taking part in that network should be able to update information, should be able to write information, should be able to execute information. And then one of the best property, if we look at it overall, we'll discuss one after the other, but just as a basic ingredient, one of the things that we always hear about the blockchain technology is the temper-proof approach, meaning you can see it, you can read it, but once you write it down, you will not be able to change it. You will not be able to modify it. You will not be, actually it comes, it comes as uh, one of the base, best property that we can think of. However, it also has its own drawback. Think of information that you have put in the blockchain and then that information is not something that you want to put. Then can I change it? Can I update it? Can I, you know, can I make any amendment? So probably that is uh, uh, something that will not be possible within a blockchain environment. So in, 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 in the short of the basic properties, we can see that it's readable by all, writable by all, but it also temper proof for all. So that's one of the best uh, 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 property that we can see in the blockchain technology. Because many times, like if I want to change information, then I say, oh, data integrity, uh, uh, is it preserved? Is it protected? You know, it, like, that, that's the thing that we have to look at and say, oh, no, this data has been tempered. This data has been modified. This data has been altered. But in a blockchain technology, that possibility or that feature is taken away. Now, when we think of a blockchain, as we can see, we use the word chain to chain the blocks together. But it's very interesting. It's just like the way how we inherit the gene and ingredients of our parents to us and then passing on our gene and our, uh, you know, our, our, our property, our cell, our characteristics into our next generation. So the blockchain inherits the property as it goes along and they are linked together. That's one of the main reasons why it is very difficult to temper proof or modify or, uh, or uh, perform any uh, uh, alteration uh, in, in this network but we'll look a bit more into detail as we go along, just to give a basic overview. So if you look at the key framework, we can see that there are other elements as well, but if I look blockchain as such, then I can see these five different com compartment or component that I can uh, categorize them into. There is this big chunk of cryptography that is getting involved. We'll explore that and try to understand and dissect so that we can really you know, uh, understand what's going on inside when we talk about cryptography, what kind of cryptography are they talking about? You know, what kind of mechanism and techniques are they using? And the second one is the way how this distributed ledger is deployed over the distributed systems in the network. And then how they are connected over the network in the form of a peer-to-peer, -peer, no central controller. And then also think of if they are distributed, how do they agree on the data that is being updated? If I want to have updated data, if I want to have conduct a transaction from one node to the other node, I must have a mechanism in order to agree on to say, yes, this block is valid, this transaction is valid, or this data is valid. So there must be a consensus mechanism that we need to think of. Now, how do I make these things easier instead of me involving in the transaction, me involving personally into the activity that is happening in the blockchain network? Probably that's where we want to think of something called a smart contract that is an executable piece of code or you know, an agreed contract that will be executed as per the uh, 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 event, as per the agreed terms and conditions and so on. So instead of you and I personally getting involved in agreeing, it will be the system that will execute if it meets the criteria. So these are five main components. So let's try to explore each of them and try to understand and dissect and see what it really entails. 
If you think of this in terms of the cryptographic point of view, if you look at a Bitcoin or if you look at the Ethereum network, you see that they use this ECC approach of elliptical curve in both in terms of the digital signature creation and in terms of the, the uh, data uh, uh, maintaining data confidentiality for encryption or decryption approach because it's that public private key approach so that gives a very neat uh, 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 and, and not as heavy as that of an RSA algorithm, which really needs to have probably higher than 2048 uh, uh, or 2000 bit key size. So if you look at the ECC, even with 256 uh, bit key size, like that's what the, the, uh, the, the algorithms in terms of Bitcoin, Ethereum, they still rely on and it make, try to make things faster because of the strength of the algorithm compared to RSA approach. So to maintain the data confidentiality, authentication or non-reputation or integrity maintaining of the information through digital signature. So we would want to have this uh, public uh, uh, key cryptography approach. Why? Because I do not have a centralized controller. So if I want to send something to you, then I need to have your public key. And then I encrypt, I send, you decrypt it back using your private key. So I don't need to know your private key, but you provide me the public key and I'll send you something and so on. So it is that nature that gives us that flexibility to allow that distributed uh, 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 computation across the network when they are not being controlled by anybody. And we hear a lot about this hashing algorithm. So this is one of the very interesting technique, as we know, because this technique will allow you to uh, encrypt only one way. So you wouldn't be able to decrypt back when you have a hash uh, value into the source. So this acts as one of the biggest property, how it plays in this blockchain technology to be able to play around with the complexity level, with the execution, to solving a problem. And, uh, and we'll talk a lot about the proof of work as well later on, and then how the wallet key address is being generated so that we get an idea how these algorithms are used. And then we also have to know about that key pair generation. So when I say this key pair generation, it's not about just the public private key pair of like, you know, uh, the public key used for decryption private key, oh, sorry, uh, private key used for uh, encryption, uh, 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 decryption use the public key for uh, encryption. So it's not just that. So when we talk of like, if you look at the real world use case, then we, if we say Bitcoin, then we'll say, oh, there is something called a public wallet. So how do they generate this public wallet address? So obviously it's generated from the public private key pair association. And we'll look uh, and take one example and understand how they generate that. And there is something called this Merkle tree. And this, this is generated using the hash function. And this really is one of the key points on how they track and trace and be able to uh, really look into the whole system and make it temper proof. So it's, it's one of the key feature within this cryptographic component of the blockchain. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll have a, some of the key highlights taking an example as well as we go down the line. But now, if we look at this aspect of the encryption, decryption, or creating a digital signature, probably encryption, decryption is the straightforward approach. But if you look at the digital signature, so, oh, then how do they even verify? How do they sign in the document? How do they sign in the transactional information? So the one on the left uh, or, or on the, the one on the right, they are actually similar. It's just that if you look at uh, the one on the right side or at the transaction level, how they sign and verify using, suppose if I have to uh, sign it, then I need to use my private key. Why do I use a private key? So that the other person knows that it is really coming from me. So if I have to uh, uh, protect from non-reputation attack, they need to know that it is me who has signed this information, who has signed this document uh, or uh, uh, who has you know, uh, generated the signature. So we will be signing using the private key. Okay, all right, thank you. So, so we'll be uh, signing using our own private key. So upon receiving, the receiver will know that it is really coming from us. So when we look at the uh, signing process, we can see that, oh, okay, so I'm using my private key. And remember, they have my public key, so they should be able to decrypt it back. And the idea is they now know for sure that it is really coming from me. So during the verification process, what do I do? I will use, use the sender's public key and try to decrypt it and do a comparison after, after uh, 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 generating the hash again from that data and do a comparison and see if they are the same. So if that is the case, I know for sure that the data has not been tempered or altered or modified. So it has this amazing, beautiful, uh, uh, like say uh, features when we talk about this hashing, it's one way. So 
from the input, you get an output from the output, but you can't go back to the input. So this encryption method is really good because if I give you the output, you have no way to know what the corresponding input is. And that's why this is very useful for the password generation and password storage as well. So uh, when we look at the second factor, it says pseudo random. So if you look at it, like so there is a slight small little change in the input, there is a huge big change as well in the output. So if you look, how do I now correlate a small change in an input and then try to understand if there is any relationship between the two output of the hash function. So th there is probably a relationship, but very, very less. Now, the reason why it is, is think of it. If the input, if I look at the input, it could, could, input could be of any length. Uh, irrespective of the length of the input, I'm going to have a fixed length output. Now, if I say that, like think of it like if I just enter A and I enter the whole email into the system, I will generate a corresponding hash from those two input and it will be fixed length and there will be pseudo random in nature. And then the collision resistance is another one thing that we should really look at if we say if the SHA algorithm or hash algorithm, let's say I'm taking example of SHA-256 here. Uh, so if it is a collision resistance, in other words, do I have two different input and generate the same output? If that is the case, I would say there is a collision, meaning that system or that mechanism is not secure anymore. Think of it in terms of a password. So two different input or two different password generating the same hash if the hash is stored in the end, uh, a server, probably the server will think that it is the same password, but we have entered two different input. So that collision resistance is really, really important. And it should be deterministic in nature. So it, depending on the, the place and time, irrespective of the machine, the system, whenever I input the input value, it should generate the corresponding same hash value at all times. So if we look at that SHA-1 approach, I, uh, you know, if you look, at, I was working in network, so I, I know that if they are still using like MD5 approaches for the router authentication and so on. Uh, people know that this is not secure, but Cisco don't really care, do they, do they? So it's very interesting how people just say, oh, we have a security mechanism in place, but what kind of security mechanism are you talking about? What kind of technique you are talking about? Even SHA-1 in 2017, if you check, they'll just say, oh, we already found a collision, so SHA-1 is no longer secure and so on. So we should really know which uh, 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 kind of uh, hashing algorithm we are using when we are designing or developing the blockchain technology. So why this is really interesting? Because obviously the digital signature, the one that is signed, let's say using my private key, is not forgeable. And the interesting thing is it cannot be reused. There is a slight change in the input. There is a big change in the output of the digital signature. So you cannot reuse it and then you can't alter it or modify or temper or change. That means in other words, you won't be able to repudiate it, right? We cannot repudiate it. So that's the beauty of this digital signature. And then they use all this mechanism and technique in the blockchain technology. Now, when we talk about that key pair generation, it's very interesting. So think of it like a private public key pair. So I'm giving you a private key. Uh, so I, as let's, let's say I want to generate the corresponding wallet public key. And then I'm thinking, oh, how do I generate it? Let's say for the Bitcoin. So I say, okay, we're doing an ECC, the elliptical curve cryptography, I've generated, let's say, a private key. So how do I now generate the wallet address for that particular private key? So using that multiplication factor, using uh, uh, the uh, elliptical curve multiplication. So what I do is I generate the corresponding public key. But that is not the public key wallet that we see in the normal, let's say Bitcoin or Ethereum or any cryptocurrency in this, uh, in this case, in this example. So they have to generate because we don't want to give away straight away this as the public address. Why? Because we want to anonymize as much as we can so that they will find it really hard by just looking at our public uh, uh, wallet address. They shouldn't be able to go back to my private key. So what do they do? So what they do is they will pass this into the SHA-256 and they don't take that output as the public key, but rather they use that as an input to rip EMD 160-bit uh, uh, hashing algorithm and generate a new hash. And they are going to use this, but with conjunction of some other information. So what they do is they are going to prefix with a byte information. So it's hexadecimal value. So zero, zero, one byte. So two bit, uh, two, not two bit, sorry. Two, two hex information is being added and they generate another eight more hex characters. How do they generate? They use the same uh, uh, RIP EMD160, put that into an input with the byte information with two hex appended in the front and they generate this new hash value. And they picked up the first eight 
hex character and append and form the public, let's say in this case is Bitcoin public address. And then that's how we create the uh, 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 wallet address for uh, any blockchain technology. So when we talk about this Merkle root or Merkle tree, as we know, like if you think of the Bitcoin or, you know, like it's not that for they are really working on its transaction. So we want to really uh, offload the uh, 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 offload the uh, in terms of the network costs or verification costs. So we don't want to just, uh, uh, you know, do one by one. Think of it like if I have n number of transactions and if I want to send it from one place to the other, I want to club them together and then I don't want anybody to temper and modify along the way. So I try to use this method of hierarchically grouping them together using the hash function. Think of it like if I have D1, D2, D3, D4 as a data set or as a transactions, now I create a Merkle root, as you can see, they are the hash, hash of a hash, as you go along D1, D2, generate the hash of each of them, the hash of these two output, put it and then generate another one more hash, and then do likewise for D3 and D2, or D4, I should have said, I'm just repeating D2 here again. So let's say D4, and then I generate the hierarchical Merkle root. So it's very interesting. Why this is very important is think of it like, if you are working in a blockchain system, and then you want to store uh, the, the uh, uh, let's say the features of the blockchain, Think of it of a uh, Bitcoin. It's really, really huge. And I have some statistics. I'll, I'll look, we'll look into that a bit later. Uh, but think of it like if it is too big, I wouldn't be able to store all the intermediate hashing information. So what do I do? Probably I store only the Merkle root. And then if there is any change or any tampering, any modification, I will be able to pick it up and say there is some change and I can start narrowing it down depending on the need. Think of it, if I want to run a blockchain in my smartwatch, then I can't keep storing all this data with all these intermediate hashes, but probably I can just store this Merkle root into my blockchain, a lighter weight of the blockchain so that I can merge myself into uh, uh, the network, which is of resource demanding in nature. So this is very interesting in nature, how this uh, uh, Merkle root has provided a, a kind of way in a blockchain system to really uh, work with uh, 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 the, the form of uh, uh, detecting the integrity or detecting the, uh, 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 in terms of the trans maintaining the transparency or uh, offloading the burden of the, the resource, you know, consuming in nature of the blockchain system. So if you think of it like, like if I have to chain them up or link them up, if you, as you can see, think of it like, if I store just as a link list and from one block to the other and say the, uh, the hash of the previous block I store in the next block. The hash of the previous block I store in the next block. So I can link them up it, that way. So that is the simplest, easiest way of linking them up. But think of it like if I have a really high spec computing, probably a quantum computer, and I can replace each of them within the block, probably uh, uh, it might not be as, as secure as we think. So probably we can think of it uh, uh, in the way of a Merkle tree as well, when we are generating the hash. Probably like instead of just storing the hash of the previous block in the next block, probably the whole of the, within the hash and the whole of the block content, I store it into the next block and then the next block content with the hash of the previous, I hash it again and I store into the next to the next block. Then if I do that, I'm chaining them up and then pro uh, passing on the inheritance passing on the characteristic of the first block to the second, first block and second block to the third, first block, second block, and third block to the fourth, and so on. That will make it a bit more, or in fact, more uh, 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 secure, like even if a high computation system is trying to replace all of the hashes in the form of the previous example of a link, link, linking of storing the hash of the previous to the next, and so on. Now, obviously, if I'm looking at the link, then I know that, okay, if there is a, some modification or change, then I can say, oh, that's not the previous hash that I store. So if that is the case, you know, you better go back and then save heal, self heal yourself and replace it back into the uh, original information that you should be. So that link list, that, that connection is really providing us a way to not only just to detect, but to, res to, to be resilient and to be strong uh, uh, within the blockchain network to maintain that secure environment. Now, when we think of the blockchain, obviously, as we say, they are distributed in nature, and then there is no central controller, there is no trusted third party involved, then obviously, when I want to update something, then there must be a method and a process. So as we say, they are peer to peer in nature. So because they are peer to peer, now if I have something, I need to communicate with each of the peer over the global network using the public private key association. 
Like when I do this, you can imagine the amount of time that it will consume. Imagine the amount of resources that it will consume. And then even after, let's say the block has been securely provided to each of them. Now, how do I even know? Do I just update it straight away to each of my, uh, 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 the chain of the nodes or uh, the chain of the blocks within the blockchain node? Probably not. Why? Because if, if that is not the data that they were sending, now how do I know that the data that was generated from the source is consistently received without any modification or tempering to each of the distributed network? So because of that, that consensus approach become a necessity. So if I do not have a consensus mechanism put in place, the blockchain system will fail. So I need to think of a consensus algorithm. I need to think of a consensus technique in this distributed environment to be able to say, yes, this is the data that I received and it is cross-checked, it's verified, and now I'm able to update it. But because remember, if I update it into a blockchain system, I cannot temper it, I cannot delete it, I cannot modify it. So I have to be very careful. So in order to make ourselves careful, consensus mechanism or the technique that we need to use to agree on the distributed nature of this network becomes really, really important. So let's see some of those just as a highlight. Now, if you think of a proof of work, that's what Bitcoin is using. And as you can see, if I have to use a proof of work, probably let's say if N nodes are there, we want all the N nodes to participate, if possible, to take part in that consensus decision-making process to validate the block or to create the block or to verify the network or to validate the network. So in this proof of work approach, if everybody is allowed to participate, as we call as the miners, we will do this a little bit as well when they perform the proof of work, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages as well, so that we understand a little bit more uh, uh, as an example on this blockchain technology. Now, in the proof of stake approach, probably I can just have a set of them, probably N out of M to take part in the consensus or decision-making process. So if I do that, that, that's really handy because everybody need not take part, but think of it in the real world. Who should be these people who should be taking part? At least in the proof of work approach, everybody takes part. So some will be probably a note from a US, not from America, not from, uh, 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 sorry, America or uh, uh, Russia or India or Pakistan, or uh, it could be from UK, Germany. It doesn't matter. But the moment you say proof of stake is a set of nodes will be participating. So who should be this set, set of nodes? So how do we trust them? How do we engage them? How do we, how do we let them take part? On what basis do we let them take part? Do we just randomly select them? Or do we have a mechanism to select based on their history information, based on the trust level? Well, if I say trust level, what do you even mean by trust level? How do you estimate and calculate the trust level? So think of it, if we start looking in a research level, it's, uh, it's more complicated because if you think of a security point of view, so I wouldn't want to select every note from UK itself in order to diversify, probably two notes from US, two notes from UK, two notes from Germany. So I need to have a mechanism and technique, not just say N out of M can take part in the consensus making process in order to validate uh, a transaction or in order to secure the network. Because as we are talking of security within the blockchain, we have to keep that in mind. Now, if we think of the proof of authority, it's very interesting. We are trying to go away from this idea of uh, uh, like, uh, you know, the centralized controller. So we want to have a distributed uh, system and we want to maintain security within the distributed system. Now, if we say proof of authority, we are kind of going back a little bit into the trusted third party approach and say, okay, we will provide authority to some of the node, probably because of their reputation, probably because of the involvement or the share of the market. So there must be a way to decide to say who should be. If it is an NHS, probably one of the nodes in NHS will be the key player in the decision-making process in the, uh, in the decision-making process of the consensus algorithms or technique that they are going to apply. Now, when we move to the delicate proof of stake is, ah, okay, so let's say we will delegate, we will say, okay, who, which, which node can take part in the consensus process within the proof of stake approach? So how do we delegate? You know, do we vote or do we take some other parameter to make the decision in order to let them take part in the consensus process? So those are the things that we need to discuss as well or design or come up as a solution in order to make the system secure. So it's very interesting if we delegate like a note from probably a Russia and not from America and if two of the notes agree, probably that is true because when two countries don't like each other and then if both of them say this is true, probably that is true. So probably we have to use some kind of approach and technique in order to let everybody within the whole of the blockchain network take part in the consensus approach. Now, we have heard about that smart contract a little bit earlier. So 
So, so when I'm working on this blockchain, there is no trusted third party. There is no real human being involved in order to validate the transaction, but it's all the systems and nodes that is taking part. If that is the case, like, there is something called a cost of verification. It was very interesting yesterday, in one of the cryptocurrency I was checking, so, can I swap some of this into the other in the Ethereum network? And then normally there is the charge around five to six pound if I want to transact around 400 to 500. Yesterday, the network was so busy and it was asking me for 125 pound for the same amount that I was trying to verify and swap across the crypto uh, uh, network between two crypto networks. So this course of verification, you know, who is going to do it? If it fails, who should be responsible? How do I automate it? So those are the things that where the smart contracts become very useful. So if I have two different network and then it's of the blockchain, like say Bitcoin, Ethereum, they are in isolation or Solana, some other network. Now, if I want to execute between them, I need to have a smart contract. Now, what happened if that uh, uh, verification failed? Do I get back all my crypto? Do I get back all my coin? So think of it in a real application as well. If I'm transacting something, now if something fails, what happened? So these smart contracts become really, really important in order to make things seamless and the cost of verification reduce. But as I say, human will not involve, it will be the network, the node and the system and the code. Uh, so we have to look at that uh, uh, integration of the seamlessness and then understand you know, how we can uh, 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 balance and check. Think of it like if I'm verifying uh, uh, at, at the noontime when I'm really busy, uh, let's say I charge you 100 pounds. And then when it is in the evening or the nighttime when nobody is really, nobody needs me, at that time I'll charge you only five pounds. And that's exactly what's happening. So who is deciding? It's a smart contract that is deciding on how the, let's say the gas fee, the network fee, cost of verification involves and so on. So if we look, so if I want to harvest the benefits of the blockchain, you can see a lot of good things. So there's no centralized controller, so, uh, but they are decentralized, distributed. So there is no single point failure. So if one node fails, it doesn't matter. Do not fail, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, and then the consensus mechanism, so it will not be just one or two people involved. It will be a set of people, set of nodes involved in order to validate whether it be a block creation, whether it be a network verification or a, 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 like validation and so on. So we can also see that it's immutable to change. Like once it is recorded, we can't alter, we can't delete that tamper-proof nature is giving us a very beautiful uh, uh, set of network and a system as a whole. So many times people just love manipulating, don't they? Just people love changing temporarily. And that will not be possible if we have a blockchain system. Now that cryptography in terms of distance in nature, we have discussed about that uh, in terms of how this is helpful and useful in order to make the system secure. And we have talked uh, about the private key and the public key. The private key is interesting because I'm the one having the key. None of you have the key. I was the one who generated this key. You didn't generate this key. So supposedly you shouldn't be knowing my key. So that's very handy. But the danger is if you lose that key, everything is gone. So there is a danger on the negative side. How do I manage my private key? And I'll do highlight a little bit as we talk about a bit of a research challenge down the line. So transparency, everybody in the network can see that's really good. And then in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, like the, the, the complex uh, contracts so they can be executed very seamlessly. You don't need to think, you don't need to worry. When do I execute? When do I validate? How much do I charge for validation? How much do I charge for a network verification and so on? So everything can be seamlessly executed. So the question is like, even if it is in a business world, like, can I trust this system? Now, many times, like if we look at the business people or the people that we work as, as probably most of us are working with the business school as well, we're trying to address uh, uh, some of their uh, security risks, security problem, in maybe in a supply chain or maybe in some other uh, uh, way of work or when they deal with system device data uh, uh, and so on in their research. So one of the things they always highlight is, can I monitor? Can I make the things traceable? Can I audit it? Can I see everything that is happening? So if they, and they say, if I have this information, if I can monitor, if I'm given a right to see and monitor, if I can trace and track, and if I am audit, you know, if I can do uh, a, an audit from the data that I have, or if the system is transparent, then it will be like cost effective. I will know what decision to make. I'll be able to take a better decision, right decision, well-informed decision, and probably the quality and trust could improve. You know, like if I have a system in which all the events and activities are recorded and I, the person is not here or the system is not here, but I'll, at least I'll be able to see what happened, how much was sent, how much was received, 
you know, in what nature the data was received and what was the feature of the data in which it was deployed, it was, uh, it was uh, 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 transported and so on. So it is very interesting how this uh, blockchain system can transform the way how the business are being conducted. It's not about just security, but it's also about the trust that it brings. It's also about the better opportunity of collaboration that it can bring, better trust level that it can bring when we talk about this blockchain technology because of the traceability, because of the transparency, because of the auditability and so on. And since it is temper proof, as you can see, like there will be no one party able to edit, delete or modify. So once it is recorded, they know for sure that this data can be trusted. And if we look at the challenges, there are so many, like it could be on a fraud race, it could be about data loss, it could be about, can I trust the so-called as the trusted party? Transactional operational risk. One of the things that is very interesting is the one that I highlighted here in yellow, informational asymmetries. In, think of it in a business world, in a supply chain, because like when we are working in a business, it's not just one party. So there are so many parties involved. And then some party has more information than the other. Some party may have very little information and they are going to make a decision. And then that's where the exploitation comes into picture. So think about those people who are collecting coffee. Think about those people who are uh, uh, selling spices in some part of the region, and then how they are extorted. When we look at the uh, uh, last mile, uh, you know, solutions. So think of the first mile problem and the last mile problem: where it is collected, where it is distributed, and think of the kind of information asymmetry that we have now. Blockchain system. Think of it if it is transparent and it is securely registered and stored, and anyone can see, that will change the game. Meaning we wouldn't be able to monopolize. We wouldn't be able to extortion you know, people on the, probably in the first mile or probably in the last mile. People will be able to see. Think of like when we are working in a business world, we just work based on the trust of the stakeholders. But in the real world, can we trust the so-called as the trusted stakeholder? Not necessary. If we can trust the so-called trust, a trusted party, then probably I, I, I remember uh, about that uh, horse meat being imported in the UK from Europe. Uh, I don't know if you still remember that news. You know, people were fed horse meat thinking they were eating beef. Now, the trusted party is the one who is distributing this. Now, I can't trust the trusted party. So I need to have a system that will help me to understand the trusted party is trustable. So there are a lot of this interesting thing. Think about the fake item that can introduce. Think of it like if you want to buy a paracetamol, think about the medicine that you want to buy. And then you just go in Amazon. You have a prime, you don't want to go out. It will be delivered in the evening or the next, next day. So if that is the case, how do you know that that medicine that is being sold in the uh, supermarket or in the Amazon is you know, an authentic, uh, verified medicine? It could be a fake one. Think of the olive oil. Many of us think that when we take olive oil, we are taking virgin olive oil. Probably 70 to 80%, if you look at the literature says, most of them are fake. So it's in the market and we are using it. Think of the brand that we are using, the branded items. 70% of them are fake. And then, then how do I trust it? Probably that's why Apple, they are very clever. So they don't sell you know, their, their uh, 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 MacBook or their iPhone in any random outlet. So they will have their own outlet to maintain that, you know, so to stop that, you know, a uh, fake item being introduced into their, uh, uh, into their system. So it's very interesting how we can see and how blockchain can address many of this problem. Now, I'll just take a short example. So just give a perspective. Now think of it like in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry. So like they say estimate 200 billion, you know, like in the market, it, it would be more, right? Because it's like around five years ago. So if you look at the data, you say, oh, that's a lot of, you know, uh, 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 fraud activity that is happening. So uh, well, many times we, we think like these things happen only in the third world, developing world. Uh, even here in the developed nation, now this fake medicine, probably the, the rough estimate is around one out of 10 is fake. So think of it, probably we're consuming some fake medicine and we are wondering why we never get killed or why we are having a lot of side effects. So we need to know, think of like where it is tracked, who is producing it, where it is uh, 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 deployed from the first mile to the last mile. If I can record this and track and trace and validate, audit, verify, then probably we will make the fraudulent market or the uh, fraud activity that is happening in the counterfeiting of drugs can be avoided or reduced to a large extent. So there must be an authority mechanism that control that manage and then that is registered 
and we know if we buy from that place, we know for sure that it's authenticated, authorized, valid medicine or the drugs. So think of it like in, even in the supply chain world, they say roughly around 40 billion annually food fraud happening. It can happen anywhere. If like, now how do I monitor this as it goes along the supply chain? If it could, it could. So, so think of it like we say, we go to market and say, we buy an organic uh, uh, broccoli. That is what we believe. But is that really organic? Is there a way to track and trace and register and know that, yes, this was the original organic item that was grown in that place, in that area, in that condition? At the moment, is we just based on belief and trust, we are uh, working together. Now, that's why it's very interesting for me to see as a researcher or all of us as a researcher to say, okay, can I look at a zero trust approach? So when I, I'm just saying, I trust you and based on the trust, the business is working. But for me, I want to follow a zero trust approach in order to really understand, can I trust when I say I trust you? So based on the data that I'm collecting, based on the information that I have, do I still retain you as a trusted individual? Do I still retain you as a trusted system? Now, many times if you go to a restaurant, you see four star or five star in terms of cleanliness and hygiene. You know, but, uh, uh, what if the day when I clean, the inspector came in and said it's a five star and the rest of the day, it's messy, it's dirty, right? So think of it in, in the real world scenario, how if we can use a blockchain, but when I say this, it doesn't mean that the blockchain alone can solve this problem. It's just a matter of storing those information in a way people can temper, in a way everybody can see. However, is blockchain alone you know, solve this problem? No, I must have a mechanism to sense the right data, right information, clean information, clean data, and put into the blockchain. Because if I don't do that, I will have a wrong fraudulent information in the blockchain system. So it's not blockchain alone can solve this problem. It just provides us that infrastructure to be able to see, to be able to audit, to be able to make it visible all across the network, irrespective of the place and time or the reason. So blockchain definitely, I believe that can make the system more profitable, can make the supply chain management more trustable, or can even probably minimize or reduce waste. When I say this, many people will say, oh, then is it that the blockchain system has all good things and it doesn't have only any bad thing? Now it's very interesting. When we think of like healthcare sector or NHS, if you want to have a blockchain system and you want to track and trace and monitor the health of uh, you know probably people living in care home, people living independent, alone, and you want to provide uh, uh, you know uh, uh, remote healthcare services. So at that time, how do I maintain a privacy of a user or a data? So that's going to be very interesting because I can't just dump information into the blockchain and say, there we go, here is a blockchain network and your data is stored. But who can see this information? At what level can they see this information? Think of it, if it is a doctor and if I deploy a blockchain network in NHS, if a doctor probably can see all the detail, but should the nurse see all the detail as much as the doctor sees? Or should uh, you know a, a friend or neighbor, so at what level uh, or the user itself, at what level, what information can be made visible is going to be very important because the nature of the data in that environment is sensitive. And because of that, we must have a mechanism in place in order to protect, provide the privacy. It's very interesting. Like if many, mo most of the time you must have heard about the, uh, uh, that gentleman who has lost uh, 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 thousands of Bitcoin and he is looking for uh, 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 getting into the system back again. Uh, forget even about the private key, it was about logging back into the system. Now think of it if your private key is lost, forever gone. You wouldn't be able to get back. You wouldn't be able to get in. There is no other way of really uh, you know, uh, verifying authenticating because you'll say, do you have the private key? If you don't have it, it's, it's like a wallet that is lost on the street. You will never get back. So there is no mechanism or system through which you can get back, through which you can just re regenerate a new one and then you try to get into the wallet. Because that wallet address was generated using a specific private key and a public key association. So if that is the case, it will be next to impossible to get back to the private key uh, uh, from uh, the existing public key. So it's very interesting how we can look at it to find a way out. Think of it in terms of the scalability. If I'm managing lots of data, a lot of data, now the validation, the transaction rate, the storage, the computation, these are going to be a real big issue. Now, when Ethereum moved from uh, uh, Ethereum 1.0 to Ethereum 2.0 last year, so you must have seen them claiming and say, we have reduced the transaction costs 
by 99.99%. Uh, many of us must have read the news. But as I said, I gave you an example, a real example yesterday when I was trying to transact from one crypto to the other crypto. At that point of time, the amount of network fee that they were asking was literally 10 times more than the usual transaction uh, fee because as you know at this given point of time the crypto market is down so everybody is you know looking for selling so all the miners are busy so at that given point of time the only way that they can transact is by uh, increasing the fee and say okay the demand is more let me increase this fee and then let people use the system but because of that high demand if the transaction fails remember the fee the the, the uh, verification cost or the network cost that you have spent will not come back. That is spent, that is used, it's gone. It will be uh, it will be taken away from your account even though the transaction is not successful. Think of it in a bank. If I want to transact and send something, if it, 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 it fails, that do they, uh, do they you know, take the transaction charge? Not so. So think of it in the crypto world or in the blockchain world, how do we see it? If a transaction has to take place and somebody has to do the validation process, you know, how should be the, how should be the transaction fee payment, cost of verification, how do we manage and handle? That is one very interesting thing that we need to look at when we think of scalability as an aspect. Now, when we talk about security, as many of us, you say, ah, okay, all the security features are in there. So what kind of security problem you are talking about? So there is thing, something called usability. Think of it. Like I say, if I want to have the trust wallet and you say, oh, here are the 15 fast phrase, and then you have to use it, you have to remember it, you have to know it, and, uh, and, and just not know it, you have to know the order in which you are going to enter this information when you want to get into the system or claim back your account. How many of us would remember those 15 to 17 phrases? And each of them, random, and then each of them need to be ordered. And you are given only three attempts to get into the system. And they say, don't store this information. Where do I store them? Remember it. Can I remember all 15 to 17 of them in real life? So we must find a way to get into the system back again as well. So because it's my wallet, it's my money, it's my asset. Why should somebody just take it away because I can't access it? Think of it. That's a real big disadvantage, isn't it? So if you think of a bank, if I forget my PIN, I ring them up, they issue a new PIN or issue a new card. Well and done. Good. But here... That might not be the case. If that is the scenario, think of it in a supply chain world, the first mile problem, the farmers, and they know nothing about technology. They know nothing about the skills. They have no uh, uh, cybersecurity skills here. They don't have no information about what a blockchain technology is. And we are telling them to be part of the stakeholders in the blockchain network. How are they going to use the system? It's going to be very interesting if we don't find a, a, an alternative way to solve uh, the problem. Blockchain will just become a big failure in a supply chain management. Now, uh, uh, interoperability is a big issue. Now, how do I make two different network operate uh, 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 in a blockchain network? Suppose like Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Solana, or ADA, so all this blockchain network that we have, how do I make it interoperable? So that's one big issue that we need to address. Because in the real world, as you can think of it, like so there is a finance sector getting involved. There is this uh, 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 insurance company involved. There is this farmer, grower involved. And there, there is this transportation involved and distribution involved. So you can see the middleman and, and, uh, 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 and, and, and the last mile. So there are a lot of these stakeholders. And so how do I make it interoperable? Each of them might have their own priority. Each of them working in their own network. How do I integrate them in, uh, so that they can talk to each other? Think about the power and energy that it consumes. I'll talk, take a small example with the Bitcoin after this slide uh, before I wrapped up uh, how this is a real big issue. Regulation and governance, as you, as you know, as you can see, it's a real big issue. Now, money laundering, crypto laundering, and how do I stop it? How do I monitor it? How do I check it? And so on. So it's going to be a very interesting if we talk of a blockchain application in, let's say, a real business world or a supply chain world. What about user adoption? That's going to be a real challenge as I've highlighted some of them. Maybe due to the lack of the skills, maybe due to the lack of the infrastructure, you know, maybe due to the lack of the, uh, uh, te uh, the technology knowledge and skill set that they need to have. And then, Think of it like when I'm working with this business world, data is very, very important. So I need to have a real clean data. How do I get a trusted data registered into the blockchain system? Probably can we think of an IoT system? 
but can I trust an IoT de uh, generated data when it has to get into the blockchain? So those are the things that we really, really need to consider. And just to give you uh, uh, just a perspective, uh, because Bitcoin is one of the best examples. So it, 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 will, it will not be fair not mentioning this, uh, uh, the first blockchain technology. Think of it like if I'm working with this uh, blockchain technology as a Bitcoin, that there's something called a miner or somebody who is uh, going to create a blog, who is going to do the verification, uh, who is going to do the network security, uh, block update, and all these things. So when, I, when they are doing all this amazing work, uh, uh, they are uh, spending, they are spending uh, 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 lots of, uh, let's say, uh, costs in terms of energy, in terms of computation. Why that is the case? Think of it like if I say, you have to solve a certain problem. So what could that problem be? Think of it during the proof of work approach. I say, okay, when you are generating this task, I want you to look for a number and that number, let's say a nonce, that needs to uh, uh, be hashed with the blockchain header information. And I want to generate a hash with the first two hex value as a leading zero. Now, when I say a first hex as a leading zero, probably that was easier. So. It was easier. So those days in uh, 2009 onwards, when they were solving this uh, problem, say, oh, when I'm creating a blog, they said they are being rewarded. So how much they are being rewarded? 50 Bitcoins, right? When they are do, uh, doing between 2009 and 12, they were rewarded with 50 Bitcoins when they solve this problem. And then when a block is generated and a block is mined. So they are rewarded with 50 Bitcoins for doing all this work. But the interesting thing is, Every roughly four years, they are now, what they do is they reduce by half. So before, if they were given 50 Bitcoin, now they are going to reduce to 25 Bitcoin. And after four years, so the third halving happened in 2020 around that time. So it was reduced to half of 25, 12.5 Bitcoin. So, so what I'm trying to say is, now it's not about just reducing the Bitcoin, but increasing the complexity of the proof of work. Earlier I say, choose a nonce, tell me what nonce value. When you hash with the header information, generate a hash value that uh, generates a first hex with a leading zero. Increase the complexity by leading zero two. Increase the complexity by leading zero three. And as I keep increasing, what will happen is I will consume more and more resources in terms of power, in terms of computation. And that's how the energy consumption is just going up and up and up. So, and they are on the other side, they are, they are halving in, th in terms of the Bitcoin reward. So if that is the case, not only just making it complex, they are making it more scarce to make it available. As you know, if I generate around, I say around four years, because if I generate, or if the blockchain Bitcoin system generate around 210,000 blocks, that's the time when they do the Bitcoin halving. That's why they say around four years. So if you calculate each of the block generation for a Bitcoin takes around 10 minutes. So 210,000 multiplied by 10 minutes. If you do it, a calculation, you will realize it takes approximately around four years. So it's very interesting. If we look at the amount of data it has generated so far, it's a couple of days ago on 18th of March, you can see it has generated above 500 gigabit of information in a blockchain network. So that's a real big size. Think of in a real life application. If I generate a live data uh, uh, in a supply chain, uh, it's not going to be in gigabit or gigabyte. It's going to be in terabit, terabyte. So think of it, the amount of data that it will be generating, the, the, the nature of the data that it will generate. And if you look at this data spread, you can see that it literally just the day before yesterday, if you look at it, they are really consuming Bitcoin alone in an annual 153 terawatt hour. That's almost the size of the power consumption of Malaysia. And the carbon generation footprint, that's almost the size of a country, Bangladesh. And if you look at per Bitcoin transaction on the left-hand side, you can see the amount of electronic waste that it generates almost like 1.3 iPhones it generates for one Bitcoin transaction. It doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you're talking about, but for one Bitcoin transaction, it could be 0 0.2 Bitcoin, it could be 10 Bitcoin, but per transaction, that much amount of electronic waste is generated. Think about the carbon footprint. Like if you look at it, it's very interesting. More than 1.3 million visa transaction, that is equivalent to one Bitcoin transaction in terms of the carbon footprint. Think about the energy, electrical energy consumption. Now, literally, it's like 1,100 uh, 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 plus kilowatt hour it's consumed for one Bitcoin transaction. 
that is literally like equivalent to the average U.S. household over a month, you know, uh, uh, for uh, electricity need of the house. So when we are talking of all this amazing uh, uh, solution about the blockchain, we also have to understand about the technology's drawback and the problem that we see on this side of the blockchain technology. I think I'll wrap up there and I'll stop there and probably I'm sure you will have some question and then happy to take some question. Thank you.